Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dorothy Gundy and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, the world's most promising coronavirus vaccine candidates need to be kept in cold storage to be safe and effective. Health officials have noted progress in equipping developing countries with the machinery needed to keep the vaccine cold. Yet, nearly 3 billion people live in places where temperature-controlled storage is lacking for a vaccination campaign to bring the virus under control. The result? Poor people who are among the hardest hit by COVID-19 are also likely to be the last to recover from it. Maintaining the cold chain for coronavirus vaccines will not be easy even in the richest countries. To stay effective, some vaccines must be kept in temperatures of around minus 70 degrees Celsius. Investment in cooling technology is lower this year because of the COVID-19 health crisis. So is spending for transportation and other infrastructure. Experts warn that large parts of the world lack the refrigeration equipment necessary to administer an effective vaccination program. This includes most of Central Asia, much of India and Southeast Asia, parts of Latin America, and all but a very small part of Africa. The cold chain breaks down at Gampela, a small medical center in the West African nation of Burkina Faso. The center serves a population of 11,000 and it has gone nearly a year without a working refrigerator. After its refrigerator broke last year, the center could no longer keep vaccines against diseases such as tetanus, yellow fever, and tuberculosis. Nurse Julianne Zungrana said workers used motorbikes to get vaccines from a hospital in the capital, Ouagadougou. They made the 40-minute round trip on a narrow road. Adama Tepsoba is a mother of two small children. She often walks four hours under the hot sun to get vaccinations for her baby and waits hours more to see a doctor. Recently, her five-month-old son had missed a scheduled vaccine shot because Tapsoba's daughter was sick and she could only bring one child on foot. It will be hard to get a COVID-19 vaccine, Tapsoba said. People will have to wait at the hospital and they might leave without getting it. To maintain the cold chain in developing nations, international organizations have added tens of thousands of solar-powered vaccine refrigerators. From the time vaccines are made until they are given to patients, the cold chain also requires mobile refrigeration, dependable electricity, good roads, and careful planning. For poor countries like Burkina Faso, the best chance of receiving a coronavirus vaccine is through the COVAX initiative. It is a project of the World Health Organization and the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. The goal of COVAX is to place orders for several promising vaccine candidates 
and to provide the safest, most successful ones to all nations. The United Nations Children's Agency began preparing for the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines months ago in Copenhagen. There, UNICEF crews are busy at work in the world's largest supply center for humanitarian aid. They are trying to predict shortages by learning from the past, like when protective equipment disappeared from airports or was stolen. The WHO says 42 coronavirus vaccine candidates are currently being tested in human volunteers. The vaccines most likely to be offered by the COVAX initiative must be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. The American drug company Pfizer is testing one of the most promising vaccine candidates. It requires storage at temperatures of minus 70 degrees Celsius. The company has designed a special carrying case for its vaccine. Pfizer has signed deals to supply the vaccine to the United States, Europe, and Japan. It has also expressed an interest in COVAX. Medical freezers that go down to minus 70 degrees Celsius are rare, even in U.S and European hospitals. Many experts believe some West African countries may be best positioned. Those areas suffered through the Ebola health crisis from 2014 to 2016. Like the coronavirus vaccine, the Ebola vaccine requires very cold storage. Since 2017, Gavi and UNICEF have worked to supply much of Africa and Asia with freezers for storing vaccines. UNICEF is now offering governments a list of what they will need to maintain a vaccine supply chain, and they are asking them to develop a plan. The governments are in charge of what needs to happen in the end, said Benjamin Schrieber, who is among the directors of the UN agency's vaccination program. Vaccines do not last long. Container ships are not equipped to refrigerate drugs for long periods. Shipping vaccines by air costs a lot more. The WHO estimates that as much as half of vaccines are lost internationally because of waste, theft, or heat during shipping. The German shipping company DHL estimated that 15,000 flights would be needed to send COVID-19 vaccines around the world. That would stretch the availability of aircraft and supplies of cooling materials such as dry ice, to protect the vaccines. We need to find a bridge for every gap in the cold chain, Katya Bush of DHL said. We're talking about investments. As a society, this is something we have to do. Gavi and UNICEF have experimented with sending vaccines by drone aircraft. Indian officials have also suggested the idea of setting aside part of the country's large food storage system for coronavirus vaccines. In countries such as India and Burkina Faso, a lack of public transportation presents another barrier to protecting citizens before vaccines go bad. When parts of Venezuela lost power for a week last year, the largest children's hospital in the country had to throw away thousands of shots of vaccines for diseases like diphtheria. Back in Burkina Faso, a solar-powered freezer finally arrived days after reporters from the Associated Press 
visited the health center near the capital. Health workers are waiting to be sure the freezer works before storing it with vaccines. Nationwide, Burkina Faso needs another 1,000 medical freezers. Health officials said less than 40% of the health centers that provide vaccines have working freezers. If Burkina Faso were given 1 million shots of coronavirus vaccine today, the country would not be able to administer the vaccine program. Jean-Claude Mubalama is UNICEF's head of health and nutrition for the African nation. He said, if we had to vaccinate against the coronavirus now, at this moment, it would be impossible. I'm Dorothy Gundy. German scientists say they have measured the smallest unit of time ever recorded. Researchers say the unit was measured in zeptoseconds. A zeptosecond is a trillionth of a billionth of a second. The researchers made the discovery while studying how long it took a photon, a particle of light, to cross a hydrogen molecule. The German scientists say the photon crossed the molecule in about 247 zeptoseconds. This is the shortest time span that has been successfully measured to date, the team said in a statement. The results were reported in Science magazine. The research was a project of physicists from Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. The team said the experiment represents major progress in the global race to measure shorter and shorter units of time. The method used to measure in zeptoseconds involves what is known as the photoelectric effect. This scientific law explains how and why some metals give off electrons after light falls on their surfaces. Albert Einstein is credited with discovering the photoelectric effect. He was awarded the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics for doing so. The discovery helped lead to the development of modern electronics, including radio and television. The German scientists say they used equipment at the Desi National Research Center, which operates particle accelerators. The machines are used to investigate the structure of matter. The research includes experiments in photon science. The researchers said they made the measurement by releasing X-ray waves onto a molecule of hydrogen, which is made up of two protons and two electrons. They set the energy of the X-rays so that one photon would be enough to expel both electrons out of the hydrogen molecule. The scientists explained that electrons behave like particles and waves at the same time. So after the first electron was ejected, the second followed a short time later. This process resulted in what the researchers called an interference pattern. The researchers used this pattern to measure the electrons as they were escaping. Sven Grundmann is a doctoral student at Goethe University 
who helped lead the research. He said the team used the interference of the two electron waves to precisely calculate when the photon reached the first and when it reached the second hydrogen atom. The calculation added up to 247 zeptoseconds, depending on how far apart in the molecule the two atoms were from the perspective of light, he said. The research also involved a complex spectrometer, an instrument used to measure atomic and molecular reactions. Goethe University's Reinhard Dürner said the spectrometer made it possible to observe for the first time that the electron shell in a molecule does not react to light everywhere at the same time. The time delay happens because information within the molecule only spreads at the speed of light, Dürner added. With this finding, we have extended our technology to another application. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Throughout most of the 1850s, war was a continual threat between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. Then, in the autumn of 1859, the crisis seemed to calm. Anti-slavery extremists governed only a few states of the North, and pro-slavery extremists held power in only a few states of the Deep South. There had been elections in most of the northern and southern states. Voters had rejected candidates with extremist ideas and elected moderates instead. The public saw the elections as a sign of hope that reasonable people might find a way to settle the bitter dispute over slavery. But these hopes fell apart on October 17, 1859. That day brought the news that a group of abolitionists had attacked the town of Harper's Ferry. The town was then part of Virginia. Today, it is part of West Virginia. Now... Jack Moyles and Harry Monroe continue our story. The attack was led by John Brown, an old anti-slavery extremist. Many believed him insane. He had gone to Kansas and fought bitterly against pro-slavery forces. Once, to answer an attack on the town of Lawrence, Brown and his men pulled five men and boys from their homes and murdered them. The wife of one of the men said Brown told her, If a man stands between me and what I believe to be right, I will take his life as coolly as I would eat my breakfast. Brown lost a son in a pro-slavery attack on his home at Osawatomie, Kansas. Brown and his friends were forced to flee. They watched as the pro-slavery men burned the town. Brown shook with grief and anger. I have only a short time to live, he said, only one death to die, and I will die fighting for this cause. There will be no more peace in this land until slavery is done for. I will give them something else to do than to extend slave territory. I will carry this war into the South. To fight a war against slavery, Brown needed money 
and guns. He went to Massachusetts and New York. He spoke at town meetings and met privately with abolitionist leaders. In these private talks, Brown said it was too late to settle the slave question through politics or any other peaceful way. He said the only answer was a slave rebellion. It would be bloody, Brown said, and this was terrible. But slavery itself was a terrible wrong, the same as murder. Only blood, he said, would wash away the wrongs of slavery. Brown said God meant for him to begin this rebellion by invading Virginia with a military force he already was organizing. Brown said even if the rebellion failed, it would probably lead to a civil war between North and South. In such a war, he said, the North would break the chains of the black man on the battlefield. Brown won the support of a group of abolitionist leaders. They formed a secret committee and called themselves the Secret Six. They agreed to advise Brown and, more importantly, to raise $1,000 for him. From New England, Brown went to Chatham, Canada. He went there for a secret convention he had called to form a revolutionary government. This government would rule all the slave territory that Brown and his men could capture. Forty-six representatives went to the convention, thirty-four Negroes and twelve whites. Brown told them of his plan. He said he was sure that southern slaves were ready for rebellion. He said they would rise up at the first sign of a leader who wished to break their chains. But what if troops are brought against you? One man asked. Brown answered that his men would fight in the mountains where a small force could stop a much larger one. He said his men would be well trained in mountain fighting. Brown said he expected his small force to grow much larger. He would invite the slaves he freed to join his army. And he said he thought that all the free Negroes of the North would come to fight slavery with him. The representatives approved Brown's constitution, and they named him Commander-in-Chief. Brown had decided to strike at Harper's Ferry, a town of about 2,500 people. It was in northern Virginia, about 100 kilometers north of Washington. Harper's Ferry was built on a narrow finger of land where the Shenandoah River flowed into the Potomac River. There were two bridges. One crossed the Shenandoah. The other, a railroad bridge, crossed the Potomac to Maryland. John Brown chose Harper's Ferry because there was a factory there that made guns for the army. There also was an arsenal where several million dollars' worth of military equipment was kept. Brown needed the guns and equipment for the slave army he hoped to form. Old Brown arrived at Harper's Ferry early in July 1859. Two of his sons, Owen and Oliver, and another man came with him. They rented an old house on a farm in Maryland, not far from Harper's Ferry. Brown told people that he was a cattle buyer from New York. Brown's men joined him, one or two at a time, over the next several months. 
They traveled at night, so no one would see them. Once they reached the farmhouse, they had to stay in hiding. Week by week, the little force grew. But it grew too slowly. By the end of summer, there were still less than twenty men hiding in the old house. Brown wrote letters to his supporters in the north. He asked for more money and more men. He got little of either. His supporters were afraid. Too many people knew of Brown's plans. The secret six feared they would face criminal charges if Brown attacked Harper's Ferry. Brown's men grew tired of the small, crowded rooms of the farmhouse. Brown knew he must act soon, or his young men would begin leaving. On Saturday, October 15th, three men arrived to join the group. One of them brought $600 in gold for Brown's use. Brown saw the gold as a sign that God wanted him to act. He told his men they would strike the next night. Brown held religious services Sunday morning and prayed for God to help him free the slaves. Then he called his men around him to explain to them his battle plan. They would seize the two bridges at Harper's Ferry and close them. Next, they would capture the armory and the rifle factory. They would capture as many people as possible. They would use the people as hostages for protection against any soldiers that might be sent against them. The army had no men near Harper's Ferry. Brown believed he would have all the time he needed. He believed his only opposition might be local groups of militia. He did not fear these civilian soldiers. The old man thought he and his men could hold Harper's Ferry until slaves in the area rebelled and joined them. Brown knew that Maryland and Western Virginia were full of people opposed to slavery. He expected many of them to come to his aid. The twenty-two men rested until dark, listening to rain hit the roof of the farmhouse. About eight o'clock, Brown called his group. Men, he said, Get your weapons. We are going to the ferry. A wagon was brought out and a horse tied to it. In the wagon were a few tools and some extra guns. Brown climbed into the wagon and started it toward town. Two of his men stepped out in front of the wagon, leading the way. The others walked behind. It was a dark and cold night. A light rain was falling. There was no one else on the road. After a time, they reached the high ground above the Potomac. Below them, across the river, lay the town of Harper's Ferry. Most of the town was sleeping. Only a few lights shone through the rain. John Brown was ready for his final struggle against slavery. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 